Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is John Harkins. I'm the events associate for the French American Chamber of Commerce, New York chapter, and we are happy to welcome you to our webinar, What is Your Game Plan? Force Majeure and Supply Chain Considerations. Just a quick word uh, about our organization. The French American Chamber of Commerce's mission is to provide the opportunities, experiences, and understanding that empower successful business relationships between and for members. The FACC New York chapter counts a mosaic of a thousand members representing sectors from tech to food, finance, and other professional services. These members have complimentary access to digital events featuring top industry experts and leaders, as well as personalized member to member introductions, access to the FACC member directory, and of course, will be able to connect with other member attendees of this webinar. This webinar will last about an hour with around 45 minutes of presentation and then some time left at the end for questions and answers. As always, this presentation's recording and slides will be available to all attendees and after the fact, so don't worry about missing a thing. Now, just a quick intro into our topic and our wonderful speaker here. Uh, in these unprecedented times, every business has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic in some manner. Today, we will be exploring contract considerations relating to impacts from supply chain disruption, quarantine orders, government shutdowns, and other circumstances beyond a contracting party's control. We will discuss legal considerations as businesses evaluate what they can do now to protect their rights and attempt to avoid or reduce contractual liabilities, as well as exploring what comes next and how businesses can begin to plan for the uncertain future. Guiding us through these topics is Donna Frosco. Donna is a partner at Dunnington, Bartholo and Miller, and a member of the firm's litigation, arbitration and mediation, intellectual property, advertising, art and fashion law, and international practice groups. Donna is counsel to clients ranging from startups and individual entrepreneurs to Fortune 100 companies. In addition, counsels both foreign, counsels both foreign and domestic clients on United States dispute resolution strategies. Now, I, I won't keep you all waiting any longer for the main events, so I will let Donna take over from here and we can begin. Donna? So welcome everyone. Um, John, thank you. Thank you to the Chamber for this opportunity to address your members. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, who I believe is on, my law partner, Nicola Tagoni, who is a member of the Chamber and a very active member of our France desk practice, um, who made the introduction. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I trust that everyone is safe and well listening in. Um, I am actually addressing you from the UK. Um, and so I understand we'll have some people over on this side of the pond also. Um, as John said, the, um, the presentation today is really going to focus on, in these unprecedented times, what should a business be doing um, vis-a-vis and analyzing its obligations under contracts and what should it do if, in fact, uh, circumstances are such that it's not able to comply with all obligations in the contract? And um, I understand that we have attendees uh, and there are chamber members from across industries. So I'm going to um, not tailor this to an industry, but I'm going to try to give some very general considerations for people to take back to their businesses of whatever size. Um, and it, these points will apply across industries, sectors, and sizes of businesses. Now, before I get started, I understand this may be recorded and I, as an attorney addressing non-attorneys, uh, which I believe most of you are, um, and required to go over some of this fine print. So again, it will be a general discussion. Um, the topic is incredibly fact intensive. Um, unlike other legal topics where there may be a bright line rule, as you'll see during the discussion, um, many of determinations will, determine, will turn on the actual facts and circumstances that you are undergoing right now in your businesses. Any opinions I give are those are my own. They're not those of the chamber or of my law firm. And now here's the part that I need to read into the record. Um, these presentation materials are provided for informational purposes and do not constitute and should not be considered legal advice. Specific facts and circumstances will differ. Neither transmission nor receipt of this information shall create an attorney-client relationship between me, the transmitter, and you, the recipient. You should not take or refrain from taking any action based on information contained in this presentation without consulting legal counsel of your own choosing. And under applicable professional rules of conduct, the content of this presentation may be considered attorney advertising. So with that out of the way, let's start. Um, 
the genesis of this program, and I've talked on this topic to, to, um, to, to various groups, um, started back in late January. And the photo that you're looking at right now is actually a photo from the Dunnington offices in New York. That is the view from the office that I use when I am in New York, uh, looking north on Park Avenue, a very vibrant New York. And that's the way it looked the last time I was there in late 2019. Um, in late January, um, I was in the midst of negotiating a contract, a uh, licensing agreement for a client to acquire worldwide rights to a, a fairly well-known brand and was looking at what was happening in the news and especially what was happening in China in January and going into uh, late January. Um, this particular client was in an industry which had manufacturing in China and Asia. And right away, I thought of that very little focused on provision in a contract force majeure and thought, I need to look at this, I need to talk to the client. And over that weekend, that was last week in January, <clears throat> that weekend, Italy banned all flights with China. <clears throat> France had its first confirmed um, case that week. And by Monday, February 3rd, China, uh, uh, the applicable agency in China was issuing force majeure certificates for its manufacturers. So on February 5th, I actually posted this to the Dunnington website um, for clients and uh, for friends of the firm, really advocating a risk assessment um, because if there was a supply chain disruption, as it looked like there would be, um, clients and um, businesses may be facing uh, potential problems in complying with their contracts. Um, it wasn't an optimal time for people to really um, take proactive um, risk assessments, but I wanted to, to try to put it on people's radar. I also know that businesses hate <laughs> paying lawyers when they don't have to. Um, but I also know that we are less expensive early than we are later, most of the time. So if we can be proactive, if I can have my clients be proactive, usually it will cut down on attorney time later and potential liability. So back in February, I talked about force majeure, um, gave some um, recommendations of what businesses could do in-house without contacting me or contacting their lawyer. The goal then was to be proactive and it was auditing your contracts, looking at those that might be impacted by the circumstances that were going on in the world, then focused very much on Asia and obviously never anticipated this timeline um, and a now empty uh, um, New York street. Um, I note that in France, this timeline, it, March 16th was a mandatory home confinement, but that really progressed with breathtaking speed from March 12th, closing the universities through to the home confinement. And I know we are looking at what may happen on May 11th um, and some potential easing. So I think that this discussion that we're having today um, is even more timely given the fact that governments now are looking at potential easing of restrictions and trying to open business. So now we know that this is a worldwide situation that every business has been impacted, some positively, um, retail, grocery, food deliveries, those types of industries, actually their business has increased. Most sectors are facing challenges. So uh, you'll hear as I go through this, for most examples, I'm going to, going to go back to that supply chain concern and focus on um, a disruption of, of a supply chain and try to give some thoughts on why really every business, no matter what size, needs a game plan right now. So right now, these are some of the things that we are dealing with, supply chain and shipping interruptions, travel bans, stay-at-home orders. Um, and they are having impacts on all of our businesses. Um, we don't have access to property in many jurisdictions, cancellation of business travel, remote working in webcasts. I'm not able to talk to you in a room live, um, supply chain disruption and contract fulfillment disruption, which is really where um, I'm going to focus today. So, what should a business do now? And I advocate four things that you all can do now 
um, in-house, not necessarily with your attorney, but um, to in-house. Um, identify, evaluate, understand, and plan. So identify risks and responsibilities relating to immediate impacts. And we'll talk about how those initial steps in that point is something that you all can do um, in-house. Evaluate the options for response. This is something that is going to be a business decision in conjunction with your attorney. Understand the potential impacts of your available strategies. This is going to be um, in your various business departments with your attorney. And then planning for an uncertain future, which I think also is going to be a multidimensional team effort. So what we want to do, many of us are back on our heels. We didn't see this, this, um, this situation coming. It's arguable um, whether anyone did, and that's something we'll talk about later about foreseeability. But how can we move from reactive to proactive? So I talked about identifying risk and responsibilities um, relating to immediate impacts. So what performance obligations does my business have right now? Which of those am I unable or unlikely to be able to meet based on circumstances right now and those that we know of in the foreseeable future? And there's quite a bit that's uncertain. And um, this will be key. What has caused me to be unable to timely perform? And as you see, as I go through this, unfortunately, the answer COVID-19 or coronavirus or pandemic, those three terms may not be sufficient um, for purposes of relief from obligations, minim minimization or your reduction of liability. Um, writ large COVID-19 may not be the answer. We may have to do more analysis than that. So once you identify um, the obligations you feel you may not be able to meet or the impediments that you're currently, uh, currently experiencing, identify and assess the contracts that are associated with uh, the immediate situation. So some examples order fulfillment deadlines in a contract while your cargo is on hold and can't get through customs, um, shipping being disrupted, your supplier's factory is closed by government order, um, or you cannot accept contracted deliveries for which you would have to pay because you have no access to your premises in which to receive them even though your supplier is saying that they are able and ready to, to ship to you. Um, also look at your critical agreements that are likely, likely to be impacted in the short term. They may not require uh, performance immediately, but in the short term, given all the uncertainty, what are your key critical agreements? And other bet the business relationships. So even if we go out toward the end of the year or into next year in terms of performance, if this is crucial to your business, we should be examining those right now too. And then for each of those contracts um, or business relationships, as the case may be, what is it that you would like to achieve? You're not able to fully perform. Is it that you really, for your business purposes, want to terminate the agreement? Do you simply need a delay and an extension of time to perform once you're able to get back to your premises? You can have the factory running again, you'll be able to perform. Or is it partial performance? Um, you have some inventory, you want to be able to perform, but this was, uh, this was a, a customer that you were going to cut ties with, you weren't going to renew the contract, um, and not a relationship that you, that you wanted to preserve. Would partial performance and then a termination be in your best interest right now? And at this point, if you haven't already been working for an attorney, you don't have an attorney in-house, this is really when to consult your attorney. Um, because for each of these relationships, you'll need to look at what the written agreements are, identify the risks, evaluate your options for the response, and then understand potential impacts of the available strategies. So if we're talking about, um, I'm going to go back one more. What performance obligation do you have? And this is one of the key analysis and one of the first questions that we're going to look at under a contract, not simply, I need to sell, I need to supply. What is it the contract actually says? So what constitutes a default? And if you default, what is the penalty? If your performance is impossible or unlikely or will be delayed, 
is there any excuse provision contained somewhere in the contract? And if there aren't, or if you have a contract that's silent on the matter, are there laws or legal principles um, pursuant to which performance could be um, excused? And for example, when I'm talking about a penalty and what constitutes a default, I'm going to go back to a license agreement. If you have guaranteed minimum royalties that are due, whether or not you're able to produce, uh, if you're a wholesaler, whether or not you're able to produce product and sell product, is there a provision that would alleviate you from having to sell, uh, having to pay the minimum um, guaranteed royalty, having to do so timely? Can it be delayed? Can it be, um, can there be a reduction? And it goes to the heart of the discussion today, which is force majeure. Now, most of you have heard that. Most people on this webinar would know that the literal translation, uh, translation is superior force. And basically, it's a principle that an intervening cause beyond a party's control may excuse timely performance. The application of what seems like a very simple rule can be tricky. Um, this is a definition from Black's Law and Dictionary, which is the, the go-to source for US lawyers in finding legal definitions. And if you look at that definition, it's an event or effect that can be neither anticipated, again, going to foreseeability, nor controlled. And the term is com commonly understood to encompass both acts of nature, such as floods and hurricanes, and acts of man, such as riots, strikes, and wars. Okay, simple enough. Notice missing from this de definition, public health emergency, pandemic, travel ban, shelter in place, contagion, things that we are actually experiencing right now. So how does force majeure work in practice? So all I've already mentioned, it's most often there's a contractual term that actually will be labeled more often than not force majeure. It doesn't have to be labeled that. Um, and it will address circumstances in which a party's performance becomes impossible or impractical. And it's something that the parties have agreed if certain things were to, to occur, this is how we're going to handle it. Um, it may result in delay or suspension of your obligation to perform for a specified time. It could be termination. Again, the evaluation is going to be highly fact specific and we'll have to look to the law that applies to the business relationship because courts in different jurisdictions will interpret this differently. So on your screen right now, is a sample force majeure clause. Now, this isn't one that I would advocate, but it is um, a sample that I found from a legal resource and was able to share with you. And I think it's a good one for um, just examining from a business point of view, um, this is a legal education, uh, a legal course, but from a business point of view, what types of things will be involved in the analysis of how a force majeure majeure clause could apply and i'm not going to read this because this would be used by many attorneys as sleep aid but let's just walk through it in pieces so no party so it doesn't say contractor subcontractor license or licensee uh, seller purchaser no party so we know that it's mutual either party could invoke this provision Notice too that payments are accepted. So if we go back to my example on a license agreement, if a payment was required, the obligation to make payments to the other party will not be subject to force majeure. So it cannot be excused under this clause, which is key. And many people are dealing with similar types of provisions with rent um, and other agreements right now. To such extent, I call that out because it limits what relief is available. So if this were a service agreement and you are providing three types of services and one has been rendered, uh, one right now is not capable of being performed because of current circumstances, then the other, but the other two you can perform, you are still obligated to continue with the other two. It does not obviate the entirety of the agreement. Um, caused by or results from acts beyond the Im impacted party's reasonable control. So reasonable control, I will tell you that when we talk about litigation, if this were ever to be a dispute, um, this could be hours of attorney's time just arguing about what is reasonable. Often we'll look at either the practice between the parties or we'll look at what industry um, reasonable and customal, uh, customary practices are. 
um, without limitation. This is key because it's saying that we're going to look at a, a cause or an event beyond a party's control, including without limitation. So here are some examples of what the event could be, but these aren't the only examples, which is good. And you'll see the list there, including acts of God, um, uh, government order, law, embargoes or blockades. I don't know if that would apply, but at the end it says other similar events or circumstances. Now it's saying, well, it's this list that we have that we as the parties have uh, foreshadowed or foreseen as possible and we've included them and other similar events. So now the question is, and we don't know the answer yet, um, is a pandemic a similar event? And that's what will play out in the courts um, over the near future. The second portion of that sample provision I gave is very important because it's something I'm going to emphasize for the next um, the half hour, um, is notice. I cannot emphasize enough that timely notice is required to, um, to retain one's rights to even claim force majeure or claim relief. Um, so here we have a number of days, notice must be given with a number, number of days um, of the event. The other thing that will be key is defining what the event was. So was the event the declaration of an emergency in your jurisdiction? Or was the event the order that shut factories? Or was the event the order that was um, a stay at home order or confinement order? And that will, that will trigger the number of days. So it's very important um, and if you haven't given notice and you have a limited number of days, you want to look at what orders, what events could have impacted and prevented your, uh, your performance. Was it that the factory was closed or was it that you don't have enough personnel to be able to conduct a business even if you can do things online because people are confined at home and don't have access? What was the event? Using diligent efforts, most force majeure doctrines and most force majeure provisions will require um, the person or the party that's trying to invoke force majeure and trying to be excused to use diligent efforts to cure, to mitigate, to find alternative sources of supply, for instance. Um, even in today's circumstances where most things are closed, I would still recommend that you document and keep records of efforts to to perform or to find other available avenues of being able to perform. Um, shall resume um, indicates that this force majeure clause intends a suspension of obligation and not a termination, but, and this is very rare, uh, but it's in the sample, termination by either party of the suspension for an uncure is if it's uncured for a certain period of time. So if the lockdown orders were to go on for two months or more, and it said, you know, there's 30 after 30 days or 45 days um, or 60 days, then either party can terminate, then the agreement may be terminated. This is a rare provision because there could be an argument that if it's the party that's trying to seek the relief um, doesn't perform for 60 days, there could be an argument on whether the party could. And so I, I think it's rare to see that but it's the type of analysis that goes into what relief um, is available to the parties. So I'll just mention that for New York, um, these, are, these clauses are narrowly construed and the party seeking to have the performance excused or invoke the force majeure clause is the one that has the burden of proof. Now, this is important and this you'll see again is a theme um, across every type of force majeure uh, contract clause and also um, legal doctrines, loss of profitability or a change of financial circumstance is not enough to invoke force majeure to be excused from an obligation. Um, the analysis will turn on the ability to perform and not the cost of performance and whether or not the uh, performing under the contract is attractive financially. So again, Notice requirements, record keeping, very important. Timing, method of delivery, that's another provision that should be somewhere in your written contract. And that's actually caused some issues right now 
when um, international shipping is delayed, um, a, a DHL, UPS are delayed, or if there needs to be um, delivery by hand or by messenger, that's been an issue when businesses are closed. Where does one deliver to? Um, I mentioned directive keeping, um, document any mitigation uh, attempts. So I'm not going to go into these in detail, but the force majeure provision we looked at is one sample of the type of provision you may have. Um, others could be a material change in circumstance in which the parties actually anticipated this is the circumstance going into the uh, contract. And if there is a material change such as, and it will be identified, then, and there will be the relief, what will the parties do? Um, also a change in law provision. I haven't seen this invoked yes, yet, but um, this is the kind of provision that uh, maybe in pharmaceuticals and the beauty industry and anything that's um, that's governed by regula regulatory agencies like the FDA, if there's a change in law saying that there's an ingredient or a key ingredient um, um, or some type of food is now banned, that could be a change in the law provision that might, um, might provide some relief. So if you do not have a force majeure provision, or if it may not apply or you don't know if it will apply, there still are legal principles, general common law principles in the United States of impossibility and frustration of purpose. And you'll be reading a lot about this and we'll have probably will have heard, um, heard about this. Impossibility seems straightforward enough. Um, the definition is actually unable to be done or happen and it is an objective standard. So where this has been applied before is for instance, the destruction of the object of the contract um, or in a services agreement for personal services, Donna Frosco is going to appear and Donna Frosco is ill or has an accident or can't appear, that's impossibility. Um, and there must be an intervening unforeseen, oh, excuse me, um, due to an intervening event. Um, it's also been applied for government actions, which may be helpful by analogy given the current circumstances and the government orders that we all are subject to right now. And again, it must result from an unforeseen event. And foreseeability is a key principle here. If it was something that was foreseen, um, but the parties didn't address it, then the parties may have, the party who wants to invoke um, impossibility may have been held to assume the risk because it was, there was a risk of the event happening and the party chose not to bring it up and not to have it included in the contract. So we compare that with frustration of purpose. Now this is where the contract is possible to be performed. It's possible, but it no longer provides the benefits that induced the parties to make the bargain because of the intervening unforeseeable events. So it's not impossible, but it, but it requires the contract to be rendered valueless to a party. It does not apply when a contract simply becomes less profitable or causes a party to sustain loss. So the purpose for entering in the contract in the first place must make little or no sense to continuing performance um, of the contract. Um, there are some laws uh, and statutory relief that could be available, and this really goes to um, the sale of goods. It's, it really doesn't apply to services, but we have in the U.S. the Uniform, Uniform Commercial Code, which has been enacted in most states in some form or another, um, UCC Section 216. And then internationally, on the international sale of goods, we have um, the Convention on the International Sale of Goods. So UCC 216, 2615A, that's the text, but basically the key points again are um, the, uh, it does not apply if the contingency was foreshadowed. So again, we go to foreseeability. If the parties could have foreseen this happening, then it will not apply. Increased cost alone, again, does not excuse performance. And it does recognize foreign and domestic regulations and laws um, that may be the event or the cause of the inability to perform. The Convention on the Contract for the International Sale of Goods, multilateral treaty, it's ratified by about 90, more than 90 countries. Uh, it does include the United States and France. Um, and 70, Article 79 of that convention um, provides in part that 
um, a party will not be liable for failure to perform if the party can prove that the failure was due to an impediment beyond uh, his control, could not reasonably be expected to have taken the impediment into account. So again, it was not foreseeable or to have avoided or overcome the consequences of this unforeseeable thing. And there I'll also note that um, if a third party could have invoked this, but it, the third party isn't a party to your contract, so such that if your supplier at the, has the factory shut down by the government order, um, and but for that you could um, you could sell to your customer, then um, you could invoke the impossibility on the part of the third party or the force majeure on the part of the third party. You now I just want to mention one other shall we say tool, if you are on the other side of this equation, and it's not, the, it's not the circumstance we're using for purposes of the discussion, but if you're evaluating your ability to perform, if you're looking to your upstream supply chain, um, or if you are the, let's say the customer in this, in this situation and you, um, you want to know whether your supplier is gonna be able to deliver to you, there is limited circumstances a right in New York under UCC 2609 to request or demand adequate assurances of performance. Now it's limited, very fact specific, but it's a written demand um, based on reasonable grounds for insecurity. So did, did, for instance, here with a buyer and seller, did the buyer's exact words or actions um, lead um, lead the party to believe that the buyer would not be um, would not be performing, or has there been a change in the course of dealing? Again, UCC, so it applies to the sale of goods, um, but it's an interesting tool to keep in mind if you're in that situation and especially evaluating your um, supply chain. So foreseeability. Before we move to what do we do going forward. Um, the doctrine of force majeure and foreseeability in the age of a pandemic shelter in place orders in which healthy people are being quarantined, which is really something we haven't seen for at least 100 years, uh, mass travel bans in an age where um, the travel is an intrinsic part of international business. Um, so what truly is foreseeable and what has changed now? And um, was this pandemic foreseeable, you know, on a global scale, on a geopolitical scale? Uh, there's been arguments both ways that that we knew that a pandemic was coming. It was a matter of time. The effects of it, were they foreseeable from a business law perspective? I don't know. There hasn't been an answer from the courts yet. Um, it's something that we will, we'll, we'll see what the courts say as we move forward. But Given that, now what are the next steps in the game plan? So we go back to what uh, the four steps that I had discussed at the beginning, and now is the time to, op to evaluate your options for response and understand the potential impacts of the responses, the potential strategies. So again, this is when you would consult with your legal counsel to understand the options, understand the party's relative bargaining strength vis-a-vis um, -vis that outcome that you wanted. Did you want a termination? Do you just want to delay an additional time? And also in communicating with the other party to avoid inadvertent, inadvertent admissions or inadvertent statements that if you can't resolve, and this does go to a dispute, might be held against you or used against your interest. Um, having said that, I think communication is going to be key right now. And, and um, as John said, I come from a litigation back background, but I also um, counsel clients on transactions and agreements, and I come from that litigation background. So I tend to be more conservative and say, you know, saying less is is better. There's less, um, there's less chance of saying something inadvertent that later could be used against you. However, in these circumstances, I think communication is key. Um, most people are in a similar situation. And um, that customer that you can't deliver to because you don't have the supply and you don't have enough in inventory may not be able to accept the delivery. So it may be that you'll be able to have a meeting of the minds. Um, you may be able to avoid a dispute process. 
if you must give notice and um, invoke force majeure clause, it's going to lead to some type of communication just by virtue of giving the requirements. And again, there may be an, an amicable resolution in that case where you do have a resolution, you and that customer who cannot take um, delivery, you want to preserve the, the relationship um, and you agree, we're just going to delay. We're going to delay for, for 30 days. Let's see where we are. We're going to communicate again and then we're going to revisit it. Memorialize any, any um, agreement that you have in writing. And if you're going to amend the agreement, amend the agreement, make sure you have writing memorializing what the game plan is. If there is a dispute, you look to the contract. So uh, most contracts will, um, will specify how the dispute will be resolved, whether it be litigation or arbitration. Very generally, some pros and cons. Um, there's force behind uh, the law of litigation, and this is in the US. There's the ability to, to appeal cons timing and cost and with cost i'll note you should always look for a prevailing party clause um, in the us the the us model is that each side pays their own legal costs but you can have a prevailing party cost that would say if the prevailing party will be entitled to reimbursement of their legal fees um, and timing courts are just starting to open and take non-emergency civil matters now so we're just starting to see the first filings on, on um, cases where there's been an allegation of an inability to perform and there's been an in, uh, invocation of force majeure. So I, I would say time, uh, it's, arbitration is usually quicker than litigation. Here, I think litigation, although the courts are opening and they're doing their best and they're being very creative in how they're going to handle matters, I think you're, you can add some time on to the uh, lifespan of a litigation. Arbitration, um, this is in some jurisdictions can still be confidential. Costs can be lower because there's less discovery. There's very limited uh, appeal rights. And just, I will say, um, as a matter of experience, it's very rare that both sides are completely happy when one walks out of an arbitration. Mediation. Um, it could be binding or non-binding. This may be something that people want to consider now because sometimes, um, it really, it just takes that um, that objective third party to mediate between the parties to try to come to a resolution. Again, very fact specific, but it's something to consider. Preserving your contractual rights, again, imperative right now, um, your notice rights, uh, excuse me, your notice obligation to preserve your rights. Um, every business should be looking at those notice provisions um, because Force majeure where otherwise available has been held time and again to have been lost for failure to provide timely notice. And again, it's a fact intensive analysis. So your record keeping will be key. Um, I will notice when you're with your record keeping in your communications, um, again, dealing with an attorney, you may want you, you should pay attention to non-privileged and privileged communications if you think there's going to be a dispute and you need some type of a financial analysis or you need an expert to hire to come in to help you. If you believe there's going to be a dispute, there may be a way for the attorney to, um, if the attorney needs that assistance in preparing for a potential dispute or preparing for an actual dispute, to preserve privilege. So it's something to um, explore depending on your jurisdiction um, with your legal counsel. Okay, moving forward. Once you have done the analysis on your immediate contracts and your immediate obligations, um, which in which you have impediment, impediments, some thoughts on how we move forward. I'm going to go full circle back to being proactive. Um, audit your key contracts. They may not, there may not be an obstacle right now, but what are the expiration dates of your key contracts? Do they automatically renew in it? And if so, when are your opt-out deadlines? When are your renewal rights for um, election to renew if it's something that you want to preserve? Um, when you're able to do so, housekeeping is key. And then also looking at those contracts, when they're going to renew, and if you want to renew them, are they sufficient in the age of COVID-19? Go back to your force majeure clause, ask your attorney to look at it. Do I need to put a reference to COVID-19 in there? If you're entering into a contract next week, 
what does the force majeure say? If it says foreseeable, I would caution, what is foreseeable now? We don't know. Is it foreseeable that we are all going to be in lockdown again before the end of the year? Depending on your jurisdiction, that, that may not only be foreseeable, it may be likely depending on, on what the powers that be are saying in your, in your jurisdiction. Um, what risks are posed in the future? What's your supply chain? Um, how does that affect your risk of non-performance in the future? If you have standard forms, um, a purchase order, for example, does it contain a force majeure clause? Um, do you have standard forms that can be referenced? If you don't have a force majeure clause, um, should you add one? Should you have a standard form in the first place? Um, and if you do have a force majeure clause, again, is it sufficient in today's world? And then for your new transactions, and I am, uh, there will be new transactions. Um, Things will change. I think we're at a watershed moment, but there will be new business, there will be new opportunities, there will be innovation. Um, note and negotiate the, the force majeure clauses, your change of law clause, your material change in circumstance clauses. These are the clauses that usually go by the wayside until the end, and you know the cli clients are focused on the monetary provisions, the timing provisions, the renewals, um, and you know, force majeure, force majeure clauses are not important until they are, and right now they are. Um, again, we, I mentioned this, be prepared, prepared to pause again, monitor the developments. In New York, the executive order from Governor Cuomo, which is Executive Order 202, New York on pause, there have been 27 iterations of that order. The latest came out last night. Um, and uh, I have clients in the construction industry. Um, there, you know, there were five orders in between, but order two or what, I don't remember the number, mentioned the construction industry, and then there were several intervening, and then there was another mention the construction industry that actually imposed penalties for failure to comply with certain things. So monitor developments which are happening very quickly, and especially as we go forward for opening easing. Audit your supply chain. Who are your suppliers? Suppliers. Many of you know these, and may you may have um, a requirement that your suppliers inform you of this. If you don't, you may want to have um, that that obligation in your standard agreements now. Um, explore diversifying your supply chain. I think we're going to see this in the future. We're going to see um, new ways. Of, um, of perhaps centralizing supply chains. Of course, it will be subject to seeing if it fits within existing regulations where there be new regulations, but there will need to be contracts, there will be need to pay, be paper. House cleaning, as I mentioned, look at your current agreements. Um, and then depending on your industry and the size of your business, prepare an incident response plan. Um, it's something you may have heard of in regard to data breach. Um, or um, after 9-11, depending on the industry. These were other, 9-11 was the watershed uh, moment. The age of mass data breaches, I think was another in which we saw force majeure clauses change and businesses approaches to um, you know, devastating events or potentially devastating events um, in the case of data breach, um, change their approach to their contracting. Um, it also, regulatorily has changed and some some boards now um, require incident response plans in the case of data breach some laws um, require that you have a plan a framework um, i recommend it be multi-dimensional i recommend your legal counsel be part of it with finance with insurance with c-suite and depending on your industry public relations um, we could do a whole talk about incident response plans but Again, going forward, once we're through the crisis point right now, this is something to consider. And with that, I'm just going to mention uh, for COVID-19, um, my firm has been doing, we, we've been posting information, so I'm going to put it there. Uh, it's there for you to look at. Um, we have listed some of the topics as things develop. Um, we will be posting there as cases develop on force majeure, I will post there. Um, and you are, uh, I, I urge you to look at that if it would be helpful. And with that, 
I look forward to coming back to a very vibrant New York and seeing it. I look forward to going back to Paris because I canceled my trip there in February. Um, be well, be safe. Thank you very much. And um, if we have any questions, I'm going to turn it over to John. Thank you, Donna. Um, that was great. We uh, we do have a quick question um, that I, I think would be, it's specific, but very applicable. Um, as a supplier of software and services on a project started prior to this coronavirus event, can the customer use force majeure to delay or stop payment for software and services already delivered? Can they use it to stop or delay the project if not specifically addressed in the contract? Okay, so unfortunately I'm going to say it depends, right? Um, now you said not specifically addressed in the contract. Correct. Right, so it, it depends on what is addressed in the contract. So if, there's, if there is a force majeure provision there or something akin to that, that uh, is similar to the example that I provided that doesn't mention something that applies now. It, it isn't, there isn't a government order um, saying, and, and this is a great example for tech. Very tech right now can be booming and tech like law we're able to do on certain things we can do via video conference. We can do it online. It, that, that's that's the normal, you know, it's not normal for lawyers, but for, for in the tech industry and software, that's the normal milieu. Um, it really depends on what that force majeure says. It, if there isn't an example in the force majeure clause that would be obvious, then what does it say? And is can it be drawn by analogy? And that will be where there may be a dispute. Um, in terms of payment for services already rendered, again, it depends. Um, that might be an uphill battle, but you know, unfortunately, it's so fact specific that uh, you know, the, whoever asked the question, they're, they're, they can feel free to call me, and anyone who's attending, feel free to contact me. Um, but without more information, it would be hard for me to really address that. Um, force majeure usually applies to going forward, obligations going forward. Now, one of the obligations can be payment. Um, if it was payment for services already provided, but the payment still can't be made, does the force majeure include an exception for payment? If it doesn't, it could in certain circumstances apply to payments. So I'm sorry it was on the one hand on the other on the other, but it, it very much is fact specific. Mm -hmm. uh, and other question um, regarding SMEs, you had mentioned um, some you had mentioned in your presentation to if you don't have a force majeure clause in some standard forms to get one, um, would you be able to provide any specific resources that would act as a reliable and stable force majeure clause that an SME or even a smaller than that business can include in the standard forms going forward? Ah, um, I'm sure you could find forms online. Um, I'm not going to recommend that anyone do that because the standard form might not be not only not beneficial, it might it might run counter to your interest, whoever is asking that question. Um, for instance, in the example that we walked through, um, you know, having that payment um, exclusion in there you may not want that if you're receiving the payment. Um, having even the way that it's drafted. So if depending on the jurisdiction in which you're in, if you have the if if you have the list of the potential types of events before you have the including but not limited to, if you just list the events and say or similar, some courts will say no. Those were the events. Those were the only events. That's what you listed. And if you don't have pandemic, you don't have government order, you don't have contagion, we're not applying it. So this is one where I actually don't advocate that um, that that people try to find a one size fits all standard form. It it just doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well. We not have any more questions for you at the moment, but I would like to point out, as you had just mentioned, that you can be reached uh, for the contact information on the screen right now. Um, so I just want to point out that not only will this recording be shared to all the attendees, uh, the slides will as well. Um, so if you feel like you missed anything throughout the presentation, 
do not worry. Um, just going to the next slide, uh, Donna, I would just like to point out um, our coming webinars for the FACC. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, legal updates for U.S. businesses um, regarding employment benefits, labor and pension. Uh, so I expect to see you all there. But um, And then a couple others in the weeks following. But Donna, I would just like to thank you again for, for taking the time to be here and giving us such an insightful presentation. Um, I'm sure that some of the attendees will have a little bit more questions on a per personal basis, and I'm, I'm sure you will receive some, some contacts. But um, for now, I would just like to thank you once more, and I would like to thank the attendees for coming in. Um, and yeah, I expect to, to see you all soon. Thank you. Everyone be safe and be well. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Donna. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.